Darren Colomb, welcome to the stage. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be speaking at the homecoming again. I always love homecoming time. It's great conversations and really late nights. <laughs> But it's good fun, and it's good to meet so many like-minded people and people who are so interested in, in uh, the science that I concern myself with on a daily basis. So it's a real honor and a privilege. This talk in particular is important to me. I wanted to cover some of the finer details of atomic structure at my Tesla Tech conference uh, in 2017, but I had such a short amount of time and there's so much material to cover. I, I didn't really get to uh, hit on some of the points that I wanted to. So this talk has kind of been a long time coming and it's been a long time in my mind as to um, how I would present this uh, material and uh, make it maybe a little easier to understand. This book right here, Atomic Suicide, is, is uh, sort of the source of a lot of the material that I'm going to cover. So if you don't have this book, I highly recommend it. It's well worth the money. Uh, just in the, um, the uh, descriptions of gravity and magnetism alone make it extremely valuable. Um, and also, if you are concerned with uh, you know, the use of atomic energy on our planet right now, uh, it's good to get yourself educated on what's really uh, going on there with that book. So uh, this was the first slide of my, uh, my talk from 2017, but I really like uh, how this is phrased and written. Uh, this university is 100% about um, uh, awakening the divine spark in man's spiritual nature. Um, that's the only way we're going to have a, you know, a united and enduring uh, civilization. Um, by giving this knowledge out, um, that's the way we're going to aid people in their own personal transformation um, to the highest aspiration that an individual wants to achieve. That is really what this is all about. This building is erected for that very purpose. And um, it's just a, it's a beautiful testament to that. So this is a, what I'm going to cover, uh, just a brief outline. I'm basically... The whole crux of this is I'm going to be looking at modern science's views of atomic structure versus what Russell tells us is um, <laughs> a better description of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So um, we're going to look at the uh, accepted model right now. We're going to look at how Russell's model is uh, different or similar, but mostly different. <laughs> Um, deconstructing the material nucleus, that's where atomic suicide, uh, there's a, t a chapter in here called the, uh, the material nucleus, um, and it's basically Walter's way of deconstructing the material nucleus concept. So we'll get into that. Uh, we're going to look at, is there anything in the scientific data that's out there that already exists to prove some of the things that, you know, Russell's saying his model is different uh, than, the, than the other uh, accepted models. We're going to look at the quantum theory just a little bit. We're going to look at particle wave duality. Um, and we're going to look into chemistry a little bit deeper, uh, things like valence and atomic bonding, things that aren't necessarily uh, addressed directly from Walter, but things that I've been able to, to uh, figure out. And then we're going to, what I want to drive home is that really this is, an, this is an optical universe rather than an electromagnetic one. And I think that is such an important thing because, and I'll, and I'll show you some experiments I've done. I always try to hit it home with real world practical experiments that show what I call uh, that magnetism as a force doesn't really exist. What, what the whole... The whole situation with magnets and magnetism is really um, optics, it, because this is an optical universe. It's, it's all light, and light is the only thing that we have to deal with. And uh, so magnetism and electricity and things are kind of I identities that aren't really uh, what they are. They've been given a name that is a, a misnomer. 
So we're going to start with, uh, I'm sure everybody recognizes this. This is what you get if you go to school right now. It's the Bohr-Rutherford model, uh, as it's called. But what, what I like about the Russells, and this, this image comes from the, the home study course, uh, third edition. And what the Russells say about this is when they, when they titled the figure was, uh, this is the atomic structure misconcept, <laughs> which I thought is kind of funny. Uh, but basically, this model says that there are, you know, there are three types of charged particles with single charges. Uh, the nucleus contains, here in the middle, the protons, which are the positively charged, and the neutrons, which somehow have no charge. Um, the outer orbitals here are in multi-section planes, uh, electron shells, which are the negative charge. That's the model as it stands. But let's ask some questions about this and think about it a little bit. Can anything exist with just a single charge? Can anything really exist that is just purely positive or purely negative or neutrally charged, which is neither one? Um, so can a neutrally charged particle really even exist in our universe? Or would anything that is created as matter have some kind of charge rather than a neutral charge or no charge. Can there be such a thing as a negative charge? And I've, I, you know, I've talked a lot about this in my prior conference lectures. I always drive this home that negative charge is actually kind of like a double negative. It cancels each other out because to, to charge is to add to. Negative is subtracting. And so negative charge is kind of like saying adding by subtracting, which means you, you're not really saying anything at all. So again, it comes back to, can anything really have just a single charge on it, whether it's negative or positive? Um, do we see any evidence in nature that particles uh, just jump from one orbital path to another orbital path? Is there any evidence um, or anything that we see in nature that actually does that? Because the theory says that el electrons jump from one orbital shell to another. and uh, I don't know about you, but I've never seen the planets or comets or anything do that. Um, here's another interesting question. If like charges repel, which is the uh, principle of the Coulomb law, how does the nucleus, which is composed of positively charged protons, hold itself together? Because those protons you see here are packed really tight in the nucleus. And I don't know if you've ever tried pushing bar magnets together, but they repel if you get similar poles. So if you have similar charges in the nucleus, how can that be held together? Um, they would repel. And so in physics, they invent all these forces, the nuclear forces, strong and weak nuclear forces to account for this pretty big hole in the theory. And I say hole is kind of a joke because we're gonna see that, that the, the uh, center of the nucleus is actually a vacuum and there's nothing there. So, and I do want to point out, uh, this is the Russell's redefinition of a dipole. There are two positive charges, male and female, from extended from one central equator. Or you can think of this as equilibrium, or I always refer to the bar magnet, the so-called block wall, uh, being the magnetic light of God, which, which Walter said was a way of proving God's existence in a laboratory using magnetics. And I think that's an extremely significant uh, tip that he gave us um, to understand what light actually is. So the Rutherford Bohr model was proposed in 1913. It basically says uh, atoms are like our solar system, but we replace gravity with the electrostatic forces as if they're uh, something different entirely, but they give you the same net result or the same structure of, of, a, of a solar system on the atomic level. And really the only way to advance this uh, theory as it stands is with quantum theory, um, which is to kind of say, what I'm trying to make a point here is, is that uh, it's a theory to begin with, and the only way to advance that theory is to create more theory <laughs> in sort of a never-ending cascade of just uh, postulates and uh, when we're looking at Russell's uh, work, we need to understand the uh, differences between you know, things that are self-evident truths 
uh, things that are maybe true, but they're not quite self-evident to everybody, um, versus a postulate, which is really just a guess, an educated guess. And also that theory, when we're dealing with theory in physics, we're really dealing just with polemics, which is just sort of like argument for the sake of argument. I think my theory is right. I think your theory is wrong, so on and so forth. And, the, and in reality, it's like we're missing the point altogether. We need to get to these things, which are the self-evident truths, the, the things that we can prove to ourselves in our own, um, in our own experiences. So... We're going to look at Russell's uh, concept of what particles are, because I'm going to cover particle wave duality, but I can tell you just sort of up front that it's all waves. But Walter uses this word particle here, and I think he did that to kind of bridge the gap between the people who are so fixed in a particle-based universe that they, they need to have something similar in their mind with which they can, you know, bridge the concept. Um, so he has this drawing in, in Atomic Suicide that shows, uh, you know, the ultimate particles of the universe are actually just rings around vacuum. Or an, put another way, spinning electrical potential vortex around a point of rest, or I can say mind. If you've all studied uh, Walter's work, you'll know that that point of gravity area of rest there is really mind in every sense. It's uh, your mind, my mind, everybody's mind, the collective mind, God's mind. Um, and only when we have this spinning around this point do we have a, a separation of an inside to an outside. And my background is biology, so to me it's just like this works, this functions just exactly like the, the membrane of a cell, except we're going deeper now past the cell level into the atomic level and you could go even smaller. This, this is essentially happening on all size scales. It's a unified structure on all scales. Uh, but we're going, focusing predominantly on the, um, on the atomic level for this talk. So the entire universe of matter is basically a multiplicity of these little whirling gyroscopic rings. There's nothing else in the universe. So think about that. <laughs> So atoms are rings with holes in them, and they're caused by wave interferences. This is really important because, again, this gets back to simply optics. When we have waves uh, colliding with other waves, we generate interference patterns. And those interference patterns are basically pressure-locked uh, potentials in Walter's lingo. And those are the different elements. And so we're going to look really in depth into the structure behind uh, um, Walter's atoms. Um, so the only spheres in nature that occur are amplitude elements. The best example is carbon because it's, it's completely bisexual. Uh, it's equally male and female via the hemispheres. And I'm going to show you some drawings that depict that. But its prototype is a flaming carbon sun, which you know centers all of our solar systems uh, in various uh, time scales. And even these spheres are composed of four pairs of light rings, and I'll show you those that interior structure with some drawings. And they have to synchronize with the light spectrum. So in other words, we have a red end and a blue end, but we have to create double yellow centered by white to create a sun. So we'll look at the uh, how the colors go with the atomic structure because I feel it's so important to understand because it brings it back to, again, it's light and it's an optical universe. So we can understand atoms and atomic structure in the, in the frame of light. I think we are more accurately describing the atom than the Rutherford Bohr model does or any other model that may be advanced currently today. So Walter's concept of the atom we could say it's rings, we could say, you know, as I did here, it's just spinning around a point of still mind. But there is a structure of the wave, as I said, and it's gyroscopic is the, the word that Walter chooses to describe this. It's like spinning. If you've ever spinned a top and watched it wobble, it has a gyroscopic procession. And this gyroscopic procession is really the only thing that separates an atom of fluorine, for example, from an atom of oxygen or nitrogen. Carbon being 90 degrees 
or the wave amplitude from the wave axis puts it in, a, in the um, uh, amplitude position of the wave or the overtone. I was describing it earlier as the crest or the trough of the wave. But that's a really important, important point because it's sort of like a reversal point. That's the maximum in density that you can achieve is at the very tippy top of the wave. So these are like equators that Walter's showing us. And these unwind the sun. See, once it's generated, then it unwinds into rings again. So it's, it's rings compressing and then rings expanding uh, to create what we recognize as systems, whether they're uh, solar or atomic. He even calls it you know, atomic planetary systems because it's really the same thing, isn't it? It's the same recursive structure uh, at, at any size scale or any dimensionality. Um, and it's always extended from the zero inert gas by winding spirally in a series of four tonal efforts, which are vortices, nested vortices, if I can say that. They're, one, they're within one another, and they're all bounded by the cube. Uh, these become the true spheres uh, at the wave amplitude, as I said. Uh, acceleration and revolution winds the spheres, and acceleration of rotation unwinds them. So you can think of this as like uh, Saturn spins faster on its axis because it's farther away from the sun than Mercury, for example, which spins very slow on its axis. So this is both integration and disintegration, life and death. These are the mechanics of the vortices behind it, and the structure overall of the, of the waveform gives you um, the tonal elements. And I just love Russell's work. I mean, I fell in love with his chart the first time I saw it because he was speaking about the elements as being musical tones. And as a musician, I just resonated with that so much. I, I just sort of said internally, like, yeah, that's, that's the way it is. And it, it comes back again to that personal truth, that self-evident truth for yourself. So we're going to look into, I'm, I'm basically now going to just rip apart the Rutherford Bohr model. <laughs> um, and I'm going to do this in, in uh, five or six steps um, so that by the end of this talk, you're going to be able to talk to a, a physicist or somebody and just completely um, turn that whole understanding of chemistry upside down. But it's good. It's good to question things, I think. So we're going to start with number one. Walter points out that nature is bilateral. It is not radial. Now, some of you who have studied Walter's work really in depth you'll notice that he uses the term radial universe in some of his earlier books, especially The Universal One and The Secret of Light. The best thing I can come up with is in a discussion with Leo Russell, he probably figured out that radial wasn't quite the best way of describing uh, the universe, that it was really bilateral because bilateral implies sex division or polarity. And I think he, he figured out over years of fine-tuning the explanation of his cosmogony that some words worked better than others for actually communicating what it was that he learned in his 39-day illumination, which was, you know, uh, wordless. Um, he had to invent words such as magnetic light uh, and things like that because it, there was no vac vocabulary to accurately describe light the way that he understood it really was. So all motion in a spherical mass, it spins around its gravity shaft in a parallel plane and not around a common center of gravity, which is supposedly controls the whole mass. Uh, that's basically the theory of Newtonian gra uh, gravity is that there's a point at the center of the Earth that attracts uh, all matter that's on the, uh, standing on the surface. And that acceleration due to gravity is about 9.8 meters per second. But if we look into this, we can actually see that every plane, you can think of it, this, it's like made of slices. Does everybody see that? If you slice a sphere into planes, you will see that if you were to stack parallel ring units on top of each other, that you would form a sphere. And it's not that it rotates around one common point. It rotates only in the plane of the point of the ring equator that it's spinning on along its axis. So we're already starting to see that maybe some of the illusions of motion 
um, have confused the theorists, specifically Niels Bohr, that proposed you know the Bohr model of the atom. He did not consider that you know this is this is a bilateral, bisexual universe, not a not a radial one uh, of straight lines inward and outward. So this is more. Um, these are my own drawings, by the way. If uh, they're a little bit crude, but. Um, Sometimes when you're reading Walter's books, you just sort of say to yourself, man, I wish he had drawn something this way. And I, over years of studying, I just decided to keep a notebook and make little doodles in it when the inspiration came or the, um, uh, the impetus came of, hey, I want this clearer. Or I want to wrap my head around this better, so I'm just going to draw it out. And um, so these are kind of... Uh, my personal notes, and, I, and I've decided to do something special this year and sort of just share them and like put them out there um, as they are, uh, because to me, this this is like how I understand it, and I'm I like to just share it with everybody so that there can be you know better comprehension of uh, of what's written in the books. So, as I said, the the. It's a bilateral, so the, there's a red hemisphere and a blue hemisphere. And Leo Russell said this it was true of our, of our sun, that there was, there was a red half of the uh, spectrum in the northern hemisphere and the blue in the southern, or vice versa. But the, the point is, is it's the two coming together to create something new, the same way man and woman come together to create new life. So this multiplane concept of the Bohr atom, you see it, these intersecting planes, this can't really happen because the red male can't really flip over, come down and become in the blue in one uh, orbit. And this is what the, the Rutherford Bohr says really is that these electrons are spinning around this nucleus in eccentric orbits like this that cut the central equator. And Walter tells us, sorry, that can't ever happen. So that kind of kills it right there, but we're going to continue to kill it even more so that there's no question in anybody's mind that it's not right. <laughs> um, so here's a gravity shaft again. I'm just showing you that the, the, the shaft is really the fulcrum, and the spinning around it at 90 degrees is the lever. And I think that's really important to understand because this, this applies to electricity in the uh, what's called the, 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 the left hand rule or that you can place, uh, if you have a current flowing in one direction that at 90 degrees to it, you have a magnetic field. That's what science says now, but Walter tells us that that magnetic field in a loop around the conductor is actually a loop of force, was his term for it. So it's not really magnetic, it's actually, it's actually the lever spinning around a, a still fulcrum. The gravity shaft does not move. In a, in a conductive wire, it just sits there with the magnetic field spinning around it as the current flows. So this applies to systems as well when you have a mass, nuclear mass in the middle with orbits around it. The closer you are in that uh, orbit to the parallel shaft of your primary, then um, the, the slower you spin, on the axis, and the faster you spin uh, revolutions. And this, the inverse is true with uh, the planets as they move outwards. So uh, here I'm showing that, again, this is just a thought ring around a vacuous hole. But you can't create just this one effect alone. You also have to create uh, simultaneously the equal opposite, which is that hole being filled by centripetal motion. And this is kind of what science doesn't really understand right now, is that you know, they, they talk about black holes and things that are just vacuous holes, but they don't really understand how does matter wind up or generate or come out of empty space to uh, fill that vacuous hole. So number two, we're, so we're just going to emphasize that rings only expand in their own planes. They don't expand radially. If they did, the planets would just get bigger and bigger and bigger in diameter in all radial directions. But I'll submit for your consideration the fact that Saturn is oblate, meaning the circumference of its equator is wider than the length from pole to pole. So it's sort of like if you took a, a perfect sphere and sort of squished it in between your hands, it would bulge at the equator. 
as you see here, and sh uh, shorten along its polar axis. And this is how rings expand. They expand out in planes, not radially. So if it were to expand radially, it would just be a larger and larger and larger sphere, and nothing would ever flatten back into a disk. But we see in nature all the time that things are, in fact, flattening into a disk as they dissolve back into the zero from which they sprang. So the fact that they oblate really proves that the rings expand in their own plane and not radially. If, a, if it did, like I said, it would still be a sphere, no matter how big it was. But you can see throughout you know, space and everything that the, the planets and sun, suns expand in the plane which you know, parallel their equator. So here I'm showing uh, that Walter explains it like if you were to drop a stone, there are only three places on the earth where if you dropped it, it would fall in a straight line. Every other place that you dropped it would curve because of the lines and the planes of electrical pressure curve in each hemisphere. So if you were to drop it right at the pole, it would fall straight down. If you were to drop it at the other pole, south pole, it would drop it straight down. If you were to stand right on the equator line of the Earth and drop it, it would fall straight down. But basically, anywhere else on the planet, it's going to curve because it has to. It's, uh, it's following the, the gradient of the pressure uh, set up by the mass. There are elements preceding hydrogen, and, and we really need to consider those uh, not as an ether, but empty space. Science doesn't really have a good concept right now of what empty space is. I remember watching a, a documentary on, on PBS a few years ago about interviewing all these physicists on what the what space really is, and you know there's all these um, hypotheses that it's uh, a fabric or something like a space-time matrix that can bend and warp and all these things. But really, Walter's telling us, well, there's you know there's just there's elements full tone elements preceding hydrogen, and they follow the same structure of the octave wave. So we really only need to understand octave waves and understand that those octave waves are within other octave waves. Uh, this is going to get us much closer to what the actual situation is. So now I need to point out that, you know, the Rutherford Bohr model is a three-dimensional structure. But Walter tells us something important, that nature doesn't really begin as a three-dimensional product right from the start. It actually is non-dimensional, you could say, if it's just mind. But it's first two-dimensional, because it's made up of single-plane units, which are in themselves two-dimensional, kind of like, uh, you know, like cutting a piece of film out of a film strip. It's just a flat plane, but you project or project or stack those planes uh, along a new axis now. So I've shown here that the, the mind center extends to three cent centers. And this creates the bilateral mass. Does, does everybody see that? If you were to stack these, you know, and they were smaller diameters, then you would get a cone, and then you would get a cone in the other way as well. And so you really only get a three-dimensional universe because of the polarization. The, this, this plane is polarized and extended in two different directions, and that's how the third dimension pops out of the second. Um, I don't consider time a dimension as such because time is, is really uh, just a, a, a markation of the uh, intervals. So, in essence, if God never ceases to think, then waves will continue they will repeat themselves, and thus time will always be measuring those repetition sequences. So I don't really consider it like in some uh, Einstein, uh, different theories, they say, you know, space and time are like sort of intertwined. And in my mind, not so much because time is part and parcel of the wave. So, yeah, so getting back, so the, the moment that the, the two-dimensional units are uh, divided into pairs, and uh, unite to become the mass, that's when the 3D universe really appears. That's, that's what I want to point out there. Uh, preceding that, it's just, you know, two dimension. So, the mind image is the thought. The body image are the actions. 
and the actions are always in pairs. The thought concepts are two-dimensional, but the actions are polarized extensions, as I said, so the actions are necessarily three-dimensional. You can see that here that we begin two-dimensional cathode plane, but by the time we reach the amplitude carbon, we have a fully formed bilateral uh, spherical mass. So we started with a flat plane and we end up with a three-dimensional object. And this is essentially what we see when we look out into the universe. We see solid mass surrounded by space. So this is Walter showing us a lot of the invisibility of the structure of integration of mass out of space. We're quite familiar in our science with the dissolution of matter in, back into empty space, which is sort of the explosion-based uh, uh, concept behind a lot of our technology, such as the internal combustion engine. Uh, real quick, I just wanted to point out here, for those who aren't familiar with uh, some of the terms Walter uses describing orbits, um, we have perihelia, which is the point in the orbit uh, when the planet is nearest to its central primary, for example, the sun. And the aphelia is the point in the orbit of a celestial body at which it is the farthest from the primary. And one thing I want to point out about this is uh, in New Concept, Walter tells us there's a really big hole in Newtonian physics where um, his gravity basically says mass attracts other mass, right? But there's a part in the orbit where a planet goes around that actually accelerates toward this point in space when it reaches its uh, aphelia. And that acceleration has no mass there to attract it to that point. So it's a pretty big gaping hole in Newtonian mechanics because there's no mass there to attract the body. And yet there is an acceleration that occurs. So it can't be mass attracts other mass. There's a, <laughs> there's a big gaping hole right there in, in Newtonian physics. So this image, for those of you who have studied the home study course, you'll, you'll be quite familiar with this. The Russells used this image um, to sort of say, you know, this is the most important. I won't read this whole thing to you, but they basically tell you, um, this is the greatest advance to science that the world has ever known, just through the magnification of an atom uh, 2,700,000 times, bringing it into the range of your eye to see. They say this makes it possible to look directly at God and thereby prove that there is not but light, again, optics, optical universe in all the universe. That light, which is God, is invisible and inert when it's cold, but it becomes visible only when being compressed and brought within our range of visibility. So Walter goes on to say, well, now that we have this image, um, you know, he said this is the key for electronic people to, you know, computers, radar engineers, they can vastly improve their instruments. Um, he also tells us, hey, <laughs> you'll be able to get transmutation now from looking at this. Um, it's incalculable, incalculable uh, value is proving the division of the spectrum and the equality of pairs of opposition. And fire and water, now that's something I wanted to touch on. They're the only, really, only the only products. So again, this is like, it's ways of saying the same thing, cold and heat, wet and dryness. So. Really, you could break it down to the universe is really just water and fire. Um, and uh, a buddy mentioned something the other day about uh, electricity being water, and I think there's, uh, uh, that's 100% correct and uh, a massive insight. Um, electricity really is just water uh, as far as we're concerned with on this planet here. So we have to talk about Erwin Mueller. And this is what I wanted to touch on at Tesla Tech and I didn't get to, but this is this guy, um, this image right here was taken via a device called a field ion microscope and it was invented by Erwin Wilhelm Mueller, um, German scientist, um, 
worked at Penn, uh, Pennsylvania State um, to develop the world's first field ion microscope, which allowed us to take these fantastic pictures that the Russells speak so highly of. It's all due to this man right here. And we're going to look, uh, I got a lot of images that he produced to sort of uh, drive the point home. But does anybody notice when you look at this, does anybody see a material nucleus here or here or here or here or here or here, anywhere? There isn't one. The photo speaks volumes because the day that this was published in the scientific community should have been the day they realized that there is no solid nucleus and that a solid nucleus theory would have to go into the garbage can and we would have to start over. All these images I'm going to show you of, of this type of stuff it comes from this book published in the 60s, Field Ion Microscopy, Principles and Application. Uh, author is Erwin Mueller. He is, the, he is the guy that did all this work. So. Is this proof of Russell's atom? Well, Walter said there's mind at the center of every atom. And we can't see mind. We can only see the absence of it. And so the absence of a solid nucleus here tells us exactly that Walter is correct. And uh, I'm sure you've all seen these images in the adjacent room. Um, Looks pretty similar to me. I don't know what you guys think. <laughs> um, Walter's just showing us as the rings expand outward, they compress toward the edge. As the, as the concavity, uh, convexity flips to concavity, uh, the opposite effect. So it's, again, it's, when I say wave interferences, I mean if you have a wave coming outward and a wave coming inward, when the two meet and collide, that is when these interference patterns are produced. That's all it is. And this is, I'll show you how the field ion microscope works, but this is solid, um, it's, it's platinum. It, the, the ones here I showed you before, these are tungsten, but this one here is, is platinum metal. This is a solid metal, but if you were to able to get your eye to be able to see it, zoom in that many times to this resolution on the atomic scale, this is all you would see it is. Just empty space with electrical potential uh, rings around it. So again, it's just Walter's just shown us, it's, it's all just rings. They're the interference patterns of rings. Uh, that's all that solid material is. So let's look at the, how the field ion uh, microscope works. This is right from the book, uh, the first, you know, first section on you know, what it is. You, you know, anybody familiar with a, with a cathode ray tube or uh, some of the, it's a bit anti, antiquated technology now, but it essentially functions just like a cathode ray tube. Um, there's, a, there's a specimen right here, which is your tip of platinum or tip of tungsten. And you know, if, if you were able to take a, a needle that can actually puncture your skin and break your skin, if you were to zoom in on it far enough, you would see that it's actually rounded if you were to zoom in far enough. Does everybody get that? So even something that we think is a point or a sharp uh, object is actually rounded or curved if you were to zoom in far enough with enough resolution. So when you, essentially how you do this is you, you apply a high voltage from five to 30,000 volts and uh, you fill this, you, you evacuate it. So you see there's a vacuum pump here. You evacuate all the air out of here and you add in um, basically an inert gas, such as helium or argon. And uh, most of Erwin Mueller's work, he was using helium, and you'll, you'll see that in some of the uh, descriptions here. But this is basically how it works. You just, I, they call this ionization, but you basically just put high voltage into this needle, and, it, and you ground your screen, which is fluorescently coated, and now the image does everybody see the cone? The cone here? You start from a point, right, which is, this is zoomed in right here, but you, you expand that image and you bring it within the realm that you can see it now because you can't, you can't get your eyes to really see something that's this small. But you can if you project it like we project light from this projector onto this flat screen here. It's the exact same principle. So this is what allowed Erwin Mueller 
to image the Adam for the very first time. And we owe him a lot for doing this. So here's, um, this is iridium and the, it's, a, it's helium again. So it's helium inside uh, the, the uh, field ion microscope. And this is iridium uh, tip sample that projects this image. So do you, you all see that, you know, this is a different metal. So it's got a different structure like a snowflake, it's got a different pattern. And then we go to iridium and you know, we see a different structure yet again. So this, this tells us that you know, it's a way to image the atom, but it's also a way to peer into the geometry or the structure of, of the individual elements. It's telling us that you know, there's a difference of structure, therefore there's a difference of the geometry. And I just wanna invite you to consider two um, similar, um, ways of producing some, this type of geometry effect is one is a kaleidoscope, which you know is about as simple as it gets. It's just three orthogonal mirrors with little bits of glass in there. But you turn it, you add dynamism to it, and you generate new structure, new form, new patterns. And isn't that exactly what you're seeing here? You change the element that you're imaging and then the structure changes that you see. And the other thing I want to point out is the mirror cubes, which if you haven't looked into, I highly recommend it. But you'll see, you'll see again, this sort of this uh, pinpoints with empty space between them, uh, exactly the, the, the same type of thing again. And also water crystals. Look at all the different uh, hexagonal uh, structures of water, and they look just like this. So maybe um, what we consider solid metal is actually just water. So, have we got any more proof? Well, in 2013, there was a paper in the Physical Review uh, called Hydrogen Atoms Under Magnification, Direct Observation of the Nodal Structure of Stark States. That's a lot of quantum nonsense right there, but basically all they did is they did the field ion microscope uh, in a slightly different way, but they actually looked at the actual wave function of a hydrogen atom. There's the image. Again, this was published in 2013. Walter Russell drew this diagram in 1959. Looks pretty much like the same thing to me. So let's talk about the quantum theory. They claim that, you know, energy is within matter. This is kind of where they go wrong right at the start. Um, they also say that it exists in certain packets or bundles. Um, it doesn't really have any relation to, to what nature is doing anywhere, uh, nor does it really work with polarity, which is creating everything, uh, nor does it really fit in with the electrical wave uh, which uh, Walter tells us the octave wave creates uh, everything. So it doesn't really fit in with, with that, so it can't really be all that correct. Uh, the only cause of a, any vibration whatsoever is polarity. And a great analogy I was just discussing is um, a Mexican wave when people stand up and sit down. If you do it in the right sequence, it appears as though a wave is traveling from left to right all the way around a stadium but the people are only standing up and sitting down, which means they're only moving up and down vertically, yet we see a wave move left to right. So if a wave field is polarized and then depolarized and then polarized and then depolarized in the neighboring wave field, it will appear as though the wave traveled from here to there. Does everybody understand that? So polarity is the only cause of the vibration, any vibration anywhere in the universe. Um, so if that's the only way we can get those interchanges is between those two opposites of polarity, which extend from that zero fulcrum. See, again, because you can't ever extend away from that fulcrum zero without giving back to it. We're, we're all hitched to the same gravity shafts, so to speak. And uh, uh, Sequences are reversal. So the, the destination points between which motion oscillates in sequences of reversals. That's very important. Again, that goes back to time. Without 
Without sequences of reversal, there is no oscillation. If there's no oscillation, there is no time by which that oscillation is expressed. So that right there kind of just like whoosh, pulls the rug out from quantum theory. Um, you know, the beauty of Walter's work is he goes right, right to the crux of the, you don't have to mess around with uh, theory and, and, oh, maybe it's this, and then maybe I'll invent something. It's just like, he's like, look, this is, you got to go back to the God light because that's where everything starts and ends um, to begin again. So particle wave duality, um, basically, you know, we're going back in time to some of these early experiments in quantum theory, and they were saying, you know, well, we got this photoelectric effect where we think these charged particles are coming off when light hits it. So we think uh, light is a particle. And then they did these, um, you know, double slit experiments and different things and uh, the uh, Davison germer experiment. And um, they showed that, well, maybe it's, it's actually showing like it's more like a wave. So, you know, there's this problem in physics is it a particle or is it a wave? I mean, it, it appears to us as this, in two different experiments that it's doing both. But um, Walter tells us again, if nothing else, just for this one sentence, you should buy this book. But he says, look, the whole, the basis of this explanation rests upon the fact that the wave belongs in its entirety to the zero of gravity, while corpuscular matter actually is only in the realm of electrical motion. So every octave wave is a gravity shaft, like I said, around which the matter spins. So it's, it's really waves, in, in my, in my uh, opinion. It's all waves, even though we have things that we could say have mass and, are, and charges and things that are like corpuscular or particle matter, but that matter cannot exist without the zero of the gravity, which is the wave that it's hitched to, to. So if there's no waves in this universe, there are no particles. Does that make sense? So we're going to talk now about valence, uh, moving into some, some chemistry here. Walter says about the valence uh, that, uh, that our chemists and our physicists you know, they've recognized something of the mathematical orderliness of um, different atoms, um, and they call it valence. So in going back to the Rutherford-Bohr concept that of electron shells, uh, you would see that uh, different orbitals, you know, have different um, numbers associated with them, and that's the root uh, behind bonding. So... Uh, for example, if you said had oxygen, it has a valence of two, two rings. Um, but in the Bohr-Rutherford model, it's two, you know, uh, it's the number of electrons in the orbital. In chemistry, we basically, this is how we work out how we can bond certain elements together uh, to form compounds. You have to balance the valence so that you have uh, a total of uh, eight electrons in one valence shell. And I think eight's an interesting number. They call it an octet. The inert gases have an octet in their valence shell in, in the other theory. But in reality, the elements um, are projected from the inert gases. So the inert gases don't really contain any electrons whatsoever. Um, and They've always done this in chemistry, but they don't really know why. And that, that's the thing I want to uh, drive home here, is that they don't really understand the true nature of valence. Because the valence, again, if we're just dealing with rings as our particles around vacuum, then the helium would be our four rings because th th there's, no, uh, there's no more space for them to bond with anything because they aren't really technically elements. They're the, they're the very beginning or the seed of the elements. And then when we project the first lock potential, lithium and fluoride, for example, we have one ring uh, centering the hole, but it's a smaller ring than helium because it's, an or, it's a projection from it. And so it has a, it's beginning to compress the empty space of this hole tighter and tighter. 
Oxygen and beryllium have two rings, still smaller hole. Nitrogen and boron, three rings, and the hole is very compressedly tight now as the centripetal motion increases. Finally, we get to uh, carbon, which is, as I show you, the rings stacked bilaterally form your uh, spherical mass. And carbon would have then, therefore, a, a valence of four. Spinning rings, which get cl closer to their mind centers, however, in the uh, mind nucleus, uh, what he calls the mind nucleus of every atom, they gain more and more power in the ratio that they get closer to that hole. And I have another diagram that, that ex shows that and explains that a little bit better. But that's basically the whole concept right there in that image of the true nature of what valence actually means. It has nothing to do with electrons uh, in orbitals. Uh, couldn't be farther from the truth. So this is the image I was talking about. That you see as you get tighter and tighter to the energy source, which is that still point, your density increases and your heat increases as well. So we, Walter's showing us that this is the direction of compression. This is the direction of expansion, which lowers the potential. So you can think of this as a, as a dynamic thing. It's moving as a cone toward this point, and then it moves back to that point. Um, so the real reason that the, these rings, which are spinning, get closer to their mind center uh, the mind nucleus of every atom, they, they gain more and more power in the ratio of that closeness. So that's why when the hole is almost entirely squeezed out of a carbon sun, we know that we get an uh, enormous amount of heat generated uh, from that sun because of this compression and, and tightening closer and closer to that still point. But I want to point out that, that that stillness is always there even in a carbon sun. It centers the very, uh, very middle of it um, in every plane of every ring. And uh, that's how we express heat and power in this universe is by tightening in ever closing spiral rings closer to that point, never really truly uh, com completely doing that uh, even in a carbon sun, but that's about as far as you can go with it. Uh, electrical engineers want to point out, they've known for a long time that the, the electrical current, it doesn't flow in, in the center. It's always around the circumference of the conductor, and they call that the skin effect. Um, it's always on the outside. So if you were to actually get the current to run through the center, you would basically uh, take the solid conductor back to a gas almost instantaneously. And Walter did that experiment with a, with a tungsten wire. He had it inside of a vacuum tube and basically electrocuted that piece of tungsten wire so quickly uh, that it was gone. The mass was completely gone. And what was left as a residual in that tube was helium. So the question really is, is where, where did the helium come from? <laughs> and it was there all along because, again, the inert gases that's where you begin from, so when the mass explodes, the only thing that's left is the seed of, of what generated it. So I want to point out, too, that there's this process that Walter describes of inside-out and outside-in turning, and this happens in all wave cycles. When it's doing this, the blue side of the spectrum is within, and the red end is on the outside. Uh, when the holes are closed, though, when you get here, the red, white, hot end is actually the center now, and then the blue surrounds it, just like we have blue skies around our planet. If you were to go down into the Earth, you would see that it's red. Uh, and we, we know that because, you know, we have volcanoes and stuff, and it comes out red, doesn't it? <laughs> so bonding. Now, this is something I thought a lot about when I read a uh, new concept of the universe the first time, I, I sort of found a, a, something lacking in Walter's writings about specifically covalent and ionic bonding. Because in chemistry, the way they teach it now, it's, you know, they say, well, covalent bonding is, you know, you have an atom here and an atom here, and they're going to share these electrons, and that's what's going to keep them paired up and keep them close together. And then you have ionic bonding, which is like, 
slightly different and only occurs sometimes where you have this electron just pops right over and is just given to this one and then this guy's uh, now you have two electrostatic forces that are that are polarized and so it's going to pull them together by Coulomb's law. The only problem is, is uh, there are no electrons <laughs> to share <laughs> or to pop off and get you, you ever seen a moon just jump from uh, Saturn and go over to Mercury or something? Um, no, I don't think so. So, you know, the, really the question becomes is in, in Walter's science, well, we know bonding occurs. We know we can mix different atoms together and we'll end up with, with molecules and different compounds. But what's the driving force behind keeping them together? Because it can't be this. It has to be an optical effect or at the very least an electrical effect um, that doesn't necessarily agree with the Coulomb law. So let's get into what it really actually is. It's an optical universe. It's light. So all atoms which are generating, that is to say integrating, toward their maturity are in fact biconvex lenses, such as you see here, or here, and here. And you'll see great examples of it in Walter's charts in the adjacent room as well. Those that are radiating, however, into the cold beginnings, which is depolarizing or degenerating, are in fact biconcave lenses. And that makes sense because you just simply reverse the curvature, don't you? And that is why the universe is entirely optical because the atoms themselves are just interference patterns, which is to say curvature. Uh, that curvature reverses the same way the wave reverses from generating to uh, depolarizing. So... And he's also pointing out here that a biconvex lens centering the equator of a sphere produces what he called the gravity field. And it, the gravity field is another name for, in physics, the magnetic field. But Walter tells us that there aren't really such things as magnetic fields because there are really only electrical fields that are bound by magnetic planes of zero curvature. So a magnetic field doesn't really exist in our universe. It's really a gravitational field of radiation from a, a compressed mass uh, when it's uh, reversed and depolarizing. That's really important. I can't stress that enough. Um, more examples of optics. You can make a sphere using by uh, convex lenses and a concave lenses, like he's showing here. And it, I want to point out something, too. This is a really important uh, quote in Atomic Suicide. Walter describes at one point, he says, these vortices, you know, uh, it's kind of hard to imagine how you get this bicone shape uh, of apices coming together and then becoming a base and winding uh, so that your apices are going like this now. And you always see this in, in Walter's uh, drawings of these nested spiral cones within one another. But it's not really all that clear, like, well, how does it actually spin and w when they meet, what happens and all this. But he gives us this, this hint right here, and I just, I just think it's so important. He says, um, he says, just imagine that those two apices of those cones, they meet to create one center of gravity, and that's what you've achieved in a perfect sphere in a, in a flaming carbon sun. But as the wave progresses, they push through each other until they bore a hole right through the compressed sphere. And you can see this, he's drawing this beautifully. Do you see how they meet at this point, but then they push through so that this apex now is over here and this apex here is over here and they continue to push through each other. And as they do, that hole in the middle there widens up and becomes a larger and larger area. This is the hallmark of a depolarizing, degenerating mass. And I'll show you some examples of that uh, with pictures. But that's such an important statement right there. I think people who've been studying Walter's work for a very long time, they could, they could take this uh, description now and go back and, and study it. And um, you might get a little bit more from what he's saying now. And I want to show <laughs> You know, this is a great this is a great image, but I think Walter was cheeky. He just put you know he put this thing up here. 
And isn't that, isn't that this again right here? So those, as those two cones push through each other, you open up that ring in the center. And that's just like the Lyra Nebula. I'll show you a picture of the Lyra Nebula that, that shows, uh, shows that very clearly. And as it, as it does this, the colors reverse. So if you have uh, red on the inside, now you have blue on the inside with red on the outside. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that. But I have this image over here, and again, just to, just to even make this even more clear, you start with one single point of gravity, and that's omnipresent anywhere in the universe. You divide that into two centers, which is you know, a division of gravity, and it's, it's low potential at this point. But as you start to uh, centripetally wind from those two toward each other, you extend that cone out from both sides, and they eventually meet, but they just keep going right through, and they never change direction. That's really important. Nature seems to reverse direction, but it never does. It's always going in the same direction. So an example of this is, if you were to stand above the Earth and look down on it from the North Pole, you would see it's turning counterclockwise. But if you were to go down underneath and look at the South Pole, you'd see it's turning clockwise. But if you were to look at it from the equator, you would see it turning one of those ways. Let's just say counterclockwise. So the way I work this out is um, I realized that we have two eyes. So when you bring both your eyes above in one hemisphere, you only see one direction. And then when you bring your two eyes down underneath, you only see one direction. But it seems to be the opposite. <laughs> it's kind of a... It's a bit of a, a hard one to wrap your head around, but it never changes directions because they simply just push through each other, and that's what opens up the hole in the mass so, it, so that it can radiate outwards now. And so they push through, and they start to depolarize the mass without changing direction. That's really, really important. So now I want to talk about, because this works right into... Um, uh, another researcher in magnetics, Edward Leedskollen, who you might know from uh, his uh, Coral Castle in uh, Florida. Yeah, and uh, if you read his book, Magnetic Current, you'll, you'll see in there he has about 55 or so experiments to do with permanent magnets or electromagnetism. Um, but he has a completely different theory as to what's going on and how it works that he put pieced together all these years of uh, playing with magnets and different things. And he is essentially describing, if I can just, you know, label it something, he's describing essentially a double helical magnetic interaction. So there's, what you can see here is a red coil spiraling around, and then there's an interpenetrating blue spiral going in the opposite direction. And this is his model of direct current. So this is really cool because electrical understanding right now, there's a totally different understanding of what electricity is when it's flowing through a conductor. But Ed Leedskollen is telling us, and you can prove it with his experiments in his book, that there actually has to at least be two flows to have uh, current flowing through a wire, at least two. Now, if we take it, Walter, what Walter's telling us uh, even further, um, there has to be eight flows because there are four pairs in every octave. So once, and this is what I do, I think about this all the time when I'm engineering. This, this, this is really the crux behind next level electrical engineering, is being able to view these vortices and these spiral dynamics and to actually engineer them to do something that we want them to do instead of just wasting power. I wanna point out this, you don't have to look at all of this. I mean, you can, it's great, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful? There's so much information here, it's mind boggling. But I wanna point out this wave cycle that Walter draws you here, down here on the bottom. Do you see how it's the exact same thing as Ed Lee Scullin describes? It's, it, you, have a, you have a red wave form and you have an interpenetrating blue wave form. And at 180 degrees relative to this axis is the, the, the exact opposite. And um, that's electricity, folks, right there. So now we're gonna talk about some colors and different things, but I have a really special um, piece of information here that, so I'm the, at the university here, I'm, I'm also sort of the uh, archivist, and um, 
I, I just have looked through uh, a lot of different um, things in the archives. I've, uh, I've read the home study course, first edition, the second edition, the third edition, the fourth edition, and uh, the editions in between when they were, uh, you know, working on them. And while I was going through all this stuff, I found an explanation as to why the Russells sometimes refer to the red and the blue or the red and the green. And has anybody noticed this studying the Russell material over the years, that, that sometimes it's red and green, sometimes it's red and blue? And I wondered about this myself, and I found this, this little um, excerpt here that they were writing that it exactly explains, they say, why we refer to the spectrum, the color spectrum, as the red side and the green side. And they also explain why it's the red and the blue. So I'm just going to read this. And you can use this image right here because you see we have a blue pole and a red pole. But we also have this image here, which you can use. You see you have uh, the red side and the blue side. But the thing is, is the, all colors come out of black or invisibility but it comes out of the blue. I think this is where that phrase comes from. Oh, it came to me out of the blue. Well, all the colors in the rainbow come out of the blue because our sky is in fact blue. So I'm gonna read this and uh, it'll, it'll kind of dynamically explain uh, this image and also this image right here, which is really, you can see that's kind of the same thing, right? It's the same as the optical uh, lenses that I showed before. But it's just colorized, uh, the, and he, Walter put the colors in there. So he says, the octave spectrum is divided into four pairs, or sex mates. Each mate of each pair is on the opposite side of the divided zero line of the wave, which acts as the fulcrum of its oscillating interchanging between its mate pairs. This diagram below uh, gives not only the relative position of each pair, but their relative proportions of volume. As blue is the first evidence of heat and light which emerges from the black cold of space, it occupies more space than the others. On one side of the dividing fulcrum is the indigo blue of the green side of the spectrum. Um, and on the other side is the blue violet of the red side, here. Um, the next. Uh, the next pair are pure blue on the indigo side, uh, which means that more light and heat have been added to the indigo blue. And on the other side is violet, which means that more heat and light have come into the red side, with their consequent reductions of volume due to increased compression. Continued compression of the blue side gives the green, which precedes the yellow of the yellow pair. Again, the pair is the double yellows and the pure red on the other side, which precedes the orange um, or the yellow red uh, of the yellow pair. The final colors of the greatest heat and light of compression are the two yellows which precede the white heat of the spectrum ending and its radioactive dissolution. If you study this diagram, you will readily understand that if we describe the two halves as the red and the blue sides of the spectrum, which is literally true, it could be confusing for both sides spring from the blue pair. Does everybody see that? If they both come out of blue, it's kind of hard to say, well, it's red and, it is literally red and blue, but it's, it's, it's almost more accurate to describe it to somebody as red and green. So it is better, therefore, to describe them as the red side and the green side, for the green is not in evidence on the red side at all, nor is red in evidence on the green side. Bear in mind, however, that red and blue are true mates, for they are the only unmixed pair in the whole spectrum. This pair are constantly interchanging to manifest the life-death principle in cycles, in which the pure blue of the cold sky surrounds the hot red of centering matter, and the hot red expands in rings to surround the blue and green centers of the extending rings. Bear in mind also that the blue of the spectrum is the mother womb, and the red is the father seed, which penetrates the womb to create father and mother bodies, which again expand to recenter the blue of this universe womb.
of the universal womb to complete the two halves of the cycle of life. That's never been released, that piece of information, and I think it helps, it serves to clarify uh, why the Russells, you know, chose uh, sometimes red and green as an explanation over the red and blue, but the red and blue is literally true because they're balanced mates. Here we have some examples. This is M57, the Lyra Nebula. Uh, they call it the Ring Nebula. Does everybody see what color is it in the middle here? And what's it on the outside? So can you tell what phase of the wave that this, well, you know it's a nebula, so you already know it was a compressed sun that exploded. So the reversal of co color occurred, where now blue is at the center and red is on the outside. When it was a compressed sun, the red was centering and the blue was on the outside. This is how, this is how it literally appears in terms of the colors that, if you could see them, um, this shift occurs from the inside to the outside. It's, again, it goes back to Walter's description of an inside out, outside in. If, if you have colors, if you have blue on the outside like we have on Earth, if we were to explode the Earth and expand it outwards, you would find that the blue would have to be on the, on the center and the red would be on the outside because the wave front is moving outward from a center. So these are just some more of my you know, summations or uh, uh, drawings of what I think Walter is, is describing. Um, he uses these terms prolation and oblation quite a bit in a new concept. General reactive means that the, the poles, these two points here, are coming closer together in the, in the, in the north-south polarity uh, as the east-west um, does the opposite in the other. It expands, they, they, they push apart. So east-west draw closer together as the north-south extend away from that center. The east-west extend away from that center of gravity as depolarization draws the north and the south closer together. So these are the dynamics of the spheroids on every portion of the wave. And, and uh, I've never, th there's an image in Universal One that kind of looks like this, but uh, uh, I, I sort of wanted to redraw it again in my interpretation. Um, I think I already covered this, so we'll just skip past that. Carbon has an equator, just one, that makes it unique. All elements which are not on the wave amplitude are disunited pairs, which means that they basically have an equator themselves, they have an equator in their mate, and they also have a dividing equator uh, in the middle here. So there are three equators to factor in if you're dealing with an element that is not on wave amplitude. Uh, there's only two non-metals, which is carbon and silicon. All the rest of them are metals, even something like chlorine, which is a gas. Technically, in Russell science, it is a metal. We know, everybody knows that when we have a solid sphere carbon that it's, it's got a, a perfect cube around it, bounding it. So that's why I just draw this, this cube here right on the carbon line, because this is the only time you see a cube is when you take, uh, take for instance, uh, lithium and fluorine as two mates that are divided. If you unite them now, that you would have, uh, you would have a cubic crystal, perfectly cubic crystal. But if you were to take beryllium and fluorine, for example, uh, you would have a distorted crystal. It would not be perfectly cubic. Um, that's a really big subject, and I'm probably going to have to do a whole other lecture just on that because uh, it goes into some crazy geometry and the something called the E8 Lie group, which is a fantastically complicated mathematical form, <laughs> but really cool. Um, so this is something I wanted to show. This is the first time I've ever released this image. Uh, Walter says this, he says, by dividing the entire nine octave cycle into two opposite half cycles, one half is general active, the other half being equally radioactive, a comprehensive base for transmutation will replace the, the present concept of dislodging electrons or adding electrons to them to transmute one element into the other. This is the old concept of if I could take an electron out of lead, I would have gold and so on and so forth. But Walter kind of whimsically says, well, if I took a leg off a man, would he turn into a horse? <laughs> Sorry. Doesn't happen that way. So 
So he's actually giving us a real base for transmutation by telling us to do this. So what I did is I took the entire nine octave chart and I placed it in such a way to make my own new chart where the entire nine octaves is in one octave. That's pretty cool, I think, <laughs> because it works. It, it still fits. You have your inert gases here. Here's alphanon, which is the very first inert gas, and we have niton. So we, this, is our, this is our fixed peg of our guitar string that doesn't move, and th these are our inert gases. And then you can put the inert gases in between the, ampli the, the lock potential positions, and you still get the amplitude elements appearing right where they ought to in between the gases, with carbon, of course, always being the midline. So carbon completely divides the entire nine octave chart in half. Everything preceding carbon is general active. Everything after carbon is radioactive. So this gives you an entirely new way to look at the entire chart and where, where a particular element is within that wave cycle. So, now I also put this dotted line here. Does everybody see that dotted line? I say here, invisible space octave. So this also gives you literal understanding of how much of the universe is completely invisible to us. Everything before this line right here, which is hydrogen, is completely invisible. <laughs> and visible matter only begins right here and extends out one, outward. And I also want to point out that everything before this line in the middle is red interpenetrating the blue. Everything after this line is the blue interpenetrating the red. So this chart has an enormous amount of information in it and it's a summation of a lot of different charts of Walters all in one to give you a completely new understanding. This is sort of my gift to all of you um, along with everything else I've said. <laughs> so. I also want to point out that Walter tells us that, uh, you know, within uh, considering carbon, for example, he says carbon as a spherical mass is such a small volume compared to the volume of its wave field, which is many millions of times larger. So he says it's like having a P inside of a gymnasium auditorium would be the relative uh, ratio of empty space at the wave field around a solid carbon sun, which is massive if you take that to a stellar scale. It's, it's almost more than we can really imagine as human beings. But this is all gaseous around it. It's only solidified at the center there where six uh, tetrahedrons meet or eight diagonals. Now, do we have any proof that this is an optical universe? I don't know, go outside sometime. Um, <laughs> Double rainbows, uh, Swananoa is the most incredible place to see double rainbows. It happens there all the time. It's part of the magic of that place. Um, I've, seen, I've seen them quite a few times. Sun dogs, uh, Buddy had the same image, but uh, I like that. It's, it's good proof that it's an optical universe. Or at the very least that we have an atmosphere here of oxygen, nitrogen, that basically acts like an optical lens. It does the exact same thing that a camera does, or your eyes do. You know, has everybody realized that your eyes are curved? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have curvature. So if you, if you see a straight line, is that line really straight? <laughs> no, nah, because it's curved when it goes into the curvature of the lenses in your eye. There are no straight lines. If there was a straight line, it would be a magnetic plane of zero curvature, which reverses curvature just like a mirror does. Now... I was looking at this image, because I always like to end with like physical experiments I've done just to show you that like this isn't, you know, I've, I've actually uh, investigated the physical, how this actually works out. And Walter has this drawing. These are part of the drawings we, uh, Matt released in 2015 uh, on the Facebook. And these were sort of like unreleased drawings from Walter um, from 1954 in particular, this one is. And what he's showing here is um, a conical magnet. And again, I, I just want to reiterate my, my whole purpose for the last three years in giving these talks is trying to convince people that magnetism is optics or magnetic fields are really just the effect of optical curvature. So Walter shows us this, this bar magnet that is a, is a cone and he's showing us if we were to take iron filings and put it on the base of this cone, they would all, does everybody see where they would be? 
on the, on the outer edge, right? And that makes sense because that's where the red would be or the, the compression, the outward expansion is all on that outer rim there. But if we go to the opposite end of the magnet, which is a compressed apex, that all the iron filings would gather together in a little ball right there, compressed to a point. But the amount of material is the same on each one. It'll do the same amount of work, but one's expanded and one's contracted. So then he also shows us, do you hear, see here it's south and south with north in the middle? So what I'm gonna actually show you now is that this image from 1954 that Walter drew is actually literally true because I, I built it and it does it. So do you see this is the compressed end? Does that look just like what that is? Okay, 54, 1954 <laughs> is when this was made. I did this experiment in 2016. So let's look at the other end. Where are all the iron filings? And this is just a, what I made here is a, it's a steel cone with copper coil around it. So I made a, a solenoid or an electromagnet and I just applied DC power to the turns of the coil to magnetize the steel. But then I could turn the current off and all the iron filings would just fall right down, which is really great because in a permanent magnet, you can't shut the field off to get your iron filings off. <laughs> And they just stay there. So, and you have to sit there and pick them all off. It's a nightmare. Um, duct tape works really well, I figured out. But now I want to show you, well, okay, so he's also showing us if we take two cones and we put them apex to apex that we create a compressed mass, a sphere. And this is iron filings suspended in midair via the two cones being uh, energized via the DC current. So that works out too. Now, uh, let me take you back here just real quick. Does everybody see that it's a double north, it's two norths in the middle, and that there's an extended equator moving outward? Well, I did that too, and it works. I put, south, uh, I put north pole magnet on the base of this cone. I put north pole magnet on the base of that cone. So I had two south poles on the opposite side, just like Walter says. And I have two north poles in the middle here, which the Coulomb law says they should repel. They do not, however, because there is no attraction or repulsion in the universe. Um, but what you find is that you can extend outward on this equator quite, uh, quite a long distance, and these washers will be completely sus suspended in midair, just like I'm showing. There's another view. So I'm not even putting power into these, I'm using permanent magnets to do this. And again, the Gauss here is, is much higher than at the base. Uh, I verified that with uh, magnetic flux density measurements. There's another view, you can really see it. Does everybody see that, those are, that there's nothing holding those there except just the, uh, just the touching of that washer there. They extend outwards. So if I had a different piece of steel or a larger washer or something, I could probably you know, do all kinds of different shapes with this. Now, I've never released this image before, but this was, um, so once I had played with the, the cones uh, long enough, uh, I was studying Tesla and um, I had some ideas about, mm, what, what can you do with this if you use this as a transformer core? So I rigged up, you see, I used blue and red wire, so I didn't mix them up. Because if you wire, uh, wind two uh, parallel wires next to each other that are the same color, it's hard to figure out which one's which. So I used blue and the red, but you can see very clearly what I did is I just wound them in, uh, in bifiler is the term, bifiler winding. And I connected alternating current to this blue wire and that red wire, and then the neutral of the AC was connected to that blue wire and that red wire, and I have shorted the two unused windings together there and there. So what I did was I put power through these coils to light this light bulb. And guess what? I got light, and what do I have here? Compression that suspends iron filings. 
So what this means is that I'm doing double the amount of work. I'm doing the power of the current to run this bulb, which is a load. And I'm also have here in the center, I've created a new form of energy in addition to that load. Does everybody see that? Because I can, because I can put something here to turn this into more power either with a, like a rotational motor type of thing, or Walter used a turbine to produce, he produced massive amounts of heat here. But, I, but you see what I did is all I'm doing is I'm rewinding the electricity back up before I use it. Multiply before you divide, or divide before you multiply. It's a two-way universe. So this image here is the solution to this image. It's literally the meaning. It's, I, I'm giving it to you. <laughs> you wind the coil and you use, this, you use it to run a load. And then the power that you get here in the middle is above and beyond unity. It's more than what you put in to run this load. And Walter gave this diagram out in the home study course. But this is the build and this is the principle to show you that it's real and that it works. And just as a final proof with magnets, because I love magnets, I took a ring magnet, I sandwiched washers in between, and you sit it on a, a device called a ferrocell, and it allows you to image the magnetic field, which is invisible to us. And you see these curvature patterns. But again, to reinforce the point a million times, there's nothing in the center. It's a whole. It's mind. It's nothing, but it's everything. Does that make sense? It's, it's not physically there, but it's everything. It's power, it's God, it's love, it's everything. It's mind. It's hollow. And with that, please go to my page here. There's a donate button if you would like to support our research. Um, I would really appreciate it. And with that, I will conclude.